Okay. Thanks again. I was thank speaking. you. Thank you very much. The next speaker of today is Jana Shen. Oh, I don't have the. Oh, that's fine. That's You set up. What did you say? Oh, here. No, not this one. I saw you using it. I also you thought I was using it, but did not go. Okay. Well, the remote was in here. You can take this one and I'll give you the other one. I, I can. How did you go using it? How did you use the Zoom? Oh, here. Oh, Zoom was here. So this this is your computer. Oh, no, that this is your computer. Oh, Zoom, I have logged in already. Zoom, like that? Yeah, yeah. And then you share your screen. Oh, you share your screen. Okay, hmm? share my USB connector. Yeah, I mean the like the converter, like you. Oh, for the I have. You have the okay. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. So, oh. Yes. Oh yeah, he, he got it. He got it. Now this is the. Now I'll change the screen. Okay. Right. I'd like to thank Walter and, and uh, others, the organizers for this you know, wonderful symposium um, meeting. And it's, it's a magnificent, magnificent place for us to um, learn science and get inspired from, from everyone. And uh, so my, my talk today will be on proteome wide covalent drug designs. I, when I submitted the abstract, I must say I was in a hurry. So I really only wrote the machine learning part, but uh, this has to do uh, has a lot to do with electrostatics and constant pH simulations. So I'm from uh, University of Maryland uh, School of Pharmacy. I recently moved to the Institute for Bioscience and Biotechnology Research in Rockville. I'm still belonging to the uh, University of Maryland, uh, but just different locations. So it's very close to DC. Oh, I must I must say I, I want to also thank the uh, the postdocs and students uh, who are involved in the topics I will discuss. Uh, Yan Dong was a previous postdoc. He was now an uh, independent uh, PI in China. And Julie Harris is a um, um, product manager in a startup company in Baltimore that I founded. Uh, Ruben Liu is a research associate and Ming Zhe is a PhD student and Joe is now a FDA Rice fellow. All right, so we know a lot about constant pH at this point. Um, there are currently two groups of methods. One is known as the hybrid Monte Carlo uh, molecular dynamics approach, also known as stochastic or discrete constant pH MD. And now the names given here you are familiar with. Um, um, Antonio really was the pioneer in this field. He developed the first version of um, constant pH I believe in 1997, and that's the JCP paper that I um, read multiple times. I claim uh, to be approaching a dozen times. And later was picked up by uh, Case McCammon, uh, Roy Burke, uh, uh, and now with Miguel, so, uh, heroic uh, development. Now, um, and later, um, the idea is to expand this methodology to all item simulations. So currently, the hybrid approach or stochastic constant pH approach is based on what I call the hybrid solvent scheme in that you propagate the conformational dynamics of the system using um, R atom on scheme, but then you calculate electrostatics that determines your um, pronation states using a continuum model. It can be PB, it can be um, GB. So um, the, perhaps the dream of us is to move towards our atom because we want to study, study ion channels where ions 
cannot be really described using continuum models and uh, protein ligand binding where uh, small molecules cannot be accurately described by GB or, or PB. So uh, many years ago, when I was a system professor, I met uh, Stern, so I uh, got his first name, but uh, I met him as also a junior faculty in a meeting and he developed an approach known, now I know as the non-equilibrium MDMC approach that has costed his tenure, I must say. <laughs> But now we know the approach is actually very, very clever and very useful. Um, nonetheless, uh, there is still a bottleneck in, uh, in sampling. So if you want to talk to me, I can discuss this off, uh, off the table. But um, the Benoit Roos group is uh, moving that approach further. So they have uh, done very, uh, very, very nice work um, in bringing this to the R item scheme and uh, de uh, demonstrated that you can actually get um, accurate PK results. Now, second group of these constant pH methods is known as the lambda dynamic based uh, constant pH scheme in that we now propagate uh, conformational dynamics and protonation states simultaneously. I will describe this in a little bit in the next slide. Now the pros and cons. The pros of the hybrid MDMC approach, in my opinion, is the easy implementation and most importantly, the discrete description. So this is physical. You have the either pronated or, or depronated states, right? Zero or one. Now cons is that um, the convergence can be tricky, especially given uh, coupling between uh, several residues nearby. Now the pros of the lambda dynamic based approach is fast convergence. The, the cons is that you have the mixed states, I will show you a little bit later, that needs to be discarded before analysis. Another con, uh, pro, uh, cons is that it's hard to implement uh, because you have to uh, be able to uh, derive forces on this uh, pronation state and do the coupling part. So gradient implementation on uh, using in P PME part is particularly tricky. So we succeed, succeeded in, in doing this in 2016 and subsequently um, people followed. So now back to the lambda dynamics based scheme, we now describe the pronation depronation using a continuous variable. Lambda, now lambda can, de, can be expressed in various functional forms. We arbitrarily chose the functional form sine squared theta such that lambda is now naturally bound between zero and one, where zero describes the pronated state and one describes the depronated state. Now during the simulation, what you see is that lambda is hopping between the two states and you will see these uh, mixed states, mixed states, um, and we will discard them at, uh, uh, at the end of the simulation. And we use a biasing potential to keep the population of these mixed states very low. Now, how do we uh, consider uh, a site at pronate depronate? We can use the cutoff. And traditionally, we use cutoff you know, 0 0.2 or 0 0.8 to describe the two uh, below 0 0.2 or, or above 0 0.8 as the pronated or pronated states. Okay, so early in my career, I used 0 0.1, 0 0.9. Now I'm more generous. All right, so just very tiny bit of uh, the essence of this continuous constant pH uh, scheme. In my view, a, a key part is really the biasing potential and especially the model potential part, which also distinguished our implementation from others. So in our implementation, we emphasize the physical aspects. So I, we can derive uh, using the GB formalism, we can derive the um, model compound titration potential mean force here's expressed as delta G in a quadratic function form. So, um, but if you have double titration, such as aspartic acid or histidine shown here, you have com competition between the two titratable sites. Now this potential mean force for titrating a model, where by the way, the model means a uh, titratable site in isolation in solution. So no, not protein environment. You can also uh, derive that uh, the function is actually quadratic in both the lambda coordinate, which describes the pronation and depronation events, but also the interconversion between the two states you're describing. And with that theoretical foundation, we can actually deliver a, a design, a very clever protocol to derive individual parameters I shown here. Okay, it's not, it's, it's a fitting based on, you can see it's very beautiful fitting, it's very accurate. This is because there's a 
physical underlining. So now going to the um, explicit solvents, what happened to explicit solvent, right? Um, um, encouragingly or uh, very satisfyingly, this uh, linear response theory holds very well, such that the quadratic approximation is actually pretty good. The deviation is very small. So if you are interested in this, I can show you our early explo exploration in 2014 to show exactly how much deviation there is. And at the end, there is this very tiny deviation that actually corresponds to what uh, Onofre, Alexei Onofre has discussed in his, in his paper. So now here is a summary of the uh, uh, continuous constant pH developments in, in CHARM. We started uh, with the GBSW model, and that was in, back in 2005. In 2011, when I established my um, in independent group, we developed the hybrid solvent scheme, as I described earlier, where we propagate using two solvent models, one for confirmation of states, the other one using um, um, GB model. This is really following uh, 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 Baptista's approach. Right? Uh, and later on, we wanted to move to our atom uh, scheme in that we, we first uh, uh, implemented GRF, generalized uh, reaction field approach, because it's very easy to implement. And we also realized that um, in um, periodic boundary conditions using, uh, you know, for this kind of all atom simulations, uh, we need to have a correction because the box size, there was a box size dependence. So what we thought to do was to neutralize the charges using titratable ions. So we would have a co-titrating ion that uh, titrates uh, at the same time with, uh, with a particular uh, side chain. So for each titratable side chain, we would have one ion in solution. Uh, we, we call this a chloride ion. And chloride would uh, you know, become neutral or charged, which is not very um, realistic. So that's why in 2014, we uh, um, developed what's called the titratable water, where we have now hydronium uh, model. So converting to uh, uh, water, and water can also convert to uh, hydroxide. And they co-titrate with um, titratable residues in the protein. And um, at, this, at the time, I was very interested in studying proton transfer. I thought this would lay a groundwork for later studies because we can um, place the titrable water inside of a protein and ask question how the water, how the um, proton actually hops to, to water. Now in 2016, we uh, succeeded in implementing the PME scheme. So this is a lot of effort. It took one, over a year time. Um, this is again done in, in, in CHARM. And we showed that uh, we actually eliminated the systematic error caused by the generalized Bohr model. So that was 2016, all in CPU. Now in the modern era, we want to run simulations faster and faster. And we have now commodity GPU cards that are relatively cheap. So my lab has 2080 cards and 3080 cards. And we um, implemented the GPU version of both the GB model based constant pH, as well as the OIDM PME based constant pH model uh, methods in, in Ember package. Now the GB NEC2 model, um, just a few words about that. This is perhaps still the state of art GB model that has much higher accuracy than GBSW, which allows us to calculate uh, PK values very accurately and very rapidly. I will show you a little bit later the results of uh, using this method to calculate existing PKAs. And then we still want to do the all item constant pH simulations. That's why we um, you know, implemented this all item um, PME constant pH simulations. We um, did the, uh, use the final size correction that we uh, uh, derived in 2016. For the uh, sake of time, I'm not going to show you, show you those results. All right, so now back to the uh, how to calculate PKs using the uh, the GPU implementation. Oh no, actually this this is a single slide. I want to show you um, the correlation is zero point eight. You know when when people ask us uh, if I were the, on the review panel, where where is the R square? Right, R square is rather poor, zero point six four. But what for people in the PK business, we all know for you no know, PK shifts to to have a correlation of zero point eight. This is actually pretty good. And this is actually better than the um, continual model based uh, or hybrid solvent based constant pH method. And this is the uh, validation study using, I don't remember exactly, but seven proteins perhaps, including the stack nuclease, which is difficult to calculate its PKs for. Now back to the um, GB NEC2 based constant pH methods. 
what we use this methods for now is actually calculate pK values. More importantly, system pKs because it's very tough to calculate. On this graph, what I'm showing you here is the ability to predict whether uh, the cysteine is cysteine has the pK below 7.4 or below 8.4. 7.4 is our physiological pH, and 8.4 um, is the model pK value. And also for later, I will show you why 8.4 actually matters. So this is you know, plotting in the form of a machine learning scheme where you have uh, the false you know, four quadrants, right? The true positive, true negative are the lower uh, lower lower left than upper right, the true ones. And the false ones are diagonally, diagonally upper left and uh, lower right. So when you want to calculate accuracy, you just add up the um, this way, add up all the true uh, numbers and divide by the total, the total prediction. All right, so our accuracy is about 80% 80, 80 or 86%, depending on um, what pH cutoff you use. And precision is pretty good. And this is really um, currently the state of art because using structure-based methods, the current accuracy is about 50%. And why is so? It turns out, and this is based on studies of, I claim about 100 proteins. We came to this conclusion, conclusion and first we published uh, a couple of years ago in 2019, a different paper, where we found that in order to predict 16 pK downshift, you have to be able to predict the hydrogen bond formation. And that's not in a crystal structure, as Miguel pointed out. If you just you know, based on the crystal structure around Poisson Boltzmann calculations, you get very high pKs because the cysteine is not, uh, that thiolate uh, sulfur is not looking at uh, those polar groups and engaging them in, in hydrogen bonds. But if you run constant pH simulation, as the titration occurs, the hydrogen bond um, formation strengthens. So they actually mutually support each other. Uh, you can see in the upper plot is the hydrogen bond occupancy as, uh, as the function of pH that increases. And then the bottom plot is sol uh, solving accessible surface area, right? The surface area actually um, uh, uh, the area decreases. All right. And uh, so the, this particular case is the creatine kinase. It's, it's not a it's pseudo kinase, it's actually very big. And uh, our calculated pK value is 5.5, experiment is 5.6, and the pro pK gives 10.4 for the reason that there is no hydrogen bond nearby in the crystal structure and the cysteine is actually deeply buried. So that's why the pK is very high. So now what can we use it for, right? So many, yeah. Yes, you can ask. Questions. So, oh yeah, it's on yes. definitely, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so now Amber has both method, methods now. Does that mean both discrete and- Yes, yeah, so we didn't do a good job in advertising our methods, perhaps. <laughs> um, the method was implemented, uh, right. There was a copyright issue. Our university put the copyright on it because of the commercial use of this um, in drug design. So it's freely downloadable from, from a uh, GitHub, GitHub or GitLab. We, I think we place on both. GitHub in, in GitLab is, is downloadable. I believe that both downloadable, I mean both, I mean the GB model based and island based uh, continuous constant pH in Amber are downloadable from the, uh, the uh, Git, GitLab. Okay, so I have, to, I have to get Amber and then go over to GitLab. To right. Get, uh, okay. Yeah, so I, I show you why there was a commercial use of this, uh, this technology. Okay. All right, so we all know about uh, non-covalent binding, right? So a ligand comes in, forming non-covalent interaction, hydrophobic, bandivals, and hydrogen bonding. But what about covalent inhibitors? So what we are interested in are uh, targeted uh, covalent inhibitors. These are the inhibitors that first come in via reversible binding. Uh, and then a slow step happens in that uh, there is a, a nuclear uh, electrophilic warhead. It's a functional group placed on the small molecule that can form a, a covalent bond with a nucleophilic residue. And this residue commonly known, uh, co so far has been cysteine, but can be also lysine and other 
uh, um, amino acids. And why cysteine? Cysteine is the most nucleophilic amino acid. Okay? And desirably, we want to have very specific binding. We want to have a very highly reactive nucleophilic amino acid. So cysteine needs to be very reactive. At the same time, we want to reduce the side effect by making the electrophilic warhead uh, less reactive, just barely reactive. Okay, and that's what we call the targeted uh, COVID uh, inhibitor. So this step can be also reversible. I mean, COVID drug is a reversible covalent um, drug. And now why so? So these uh, targeted covalent inhibitor can be highly um, potent. Actually, this is the way to now overcome the potent potency limit of traditional non-covalent drugs. It has a prolonged residence time due to the covalent bond formation. It can also have improved the selectivity due to this covalent bond uh, formation. And most importantly, we now open the field of drugging undruggable um, proteins. Um, now, Protax is one technology, but uh, targeted covalent drug design is another technology, and then oftentimes they are combined. Um, in old days, when think of covalent inhibitors as a liability, because they think you know, it would be side, you, know, you would have side effects and such, but it turns out that tr tr very traditional, very safe drugs, aspirin, penicillin, are covalent inhibitors. We just didn't know that. And about 15 years ago, the whole industry started developing, discovering covalent inhibitors, starting with the cancer drug, Avitinib, targeting, assisting in EGFR, I will mention today. And following on, we have now a lot of um, covalent drugs pushing through the FDA approval uh, pipeline. And perhaps most excitingly, we have now um, the KRAS G12C uh, inhibitor. So this is a very, very important milestone because the KRAS uh, has been considered as undruggable target um, because the pocket is very shallow. And now, of course, uh, COVID Nematovir is a um, is is a covalent inhibitor targeting uh, the active site cysteine in a reversible manner. It's a reversible covalent bond formation. Okay, so how does uh, this reaction works? So what we typically use, what industry has been typically used is a what's called the activated olefin. Olefin with one or two um, groups that can draw withdraw electrons, creating a uh, very uh, uh, electrophilic uh, alpha center. And now the reaction happens on the beta. So addition happens on the beta side, C, C beta. So you would need a uh, nucleophile, which is a uh, thiolate that attacks this um, beta carbon and forming transition state. And then you will have a carbonyl intermediate state. Uh, so any uh, uh, with electron withdrawing group that can stabilize this carbonyl state uh, is gonna uh, make the reactivity higher, you know, increase the reactivity of the warhead. And now the thiolate ideally needs to be directly available, which means, Electrostatics, we want to have a depronated system, right? Thiolate state. Or you can have a nearby base catalyst that can pull off the proton or seed the proton from, from this uh, system. And there's a direct experiment that's showing uh, the observed uh, kinetic rate constant is uh, universally related to the pK value. So, meaning the lower pKa, the higher reactivity. So, this is because the lower pKa, the more. Uh, the higher percentage of the negative thiolate state. So that would promote the reaction. This is natural as you saw from the reaction mechanism. So this inspired us to um, devise a empirical scheme where we rate now the reactivities of the systems. We say if the system had the pK value lower than 7.4, which means the deprotonated fraction is, is over 50%, we call that hyperreactive. We can have a range between 7.4 and 8.4, where the deep room fraction is about 10 to 50 percent. We call that reactive. And now, um, if the pK value is between 8.5 and 9.4, we call this uh, uh, somewhat reactive because the deep room fraction is at least 1 percent but lower than 10 percent. And now, if the pK is higher than 9.4, why 9.4? This is because our body has a lot of glutathione. Okay, the free, that are uh, radical scavengers. 
if your drug is starting to hit the glutathione, that's not good, so, right? So we wanna um, not do that. So this, if, and also if the PK is higher than 9.4, the depronin fraction is already lower than 1%. We call that unreactive. And we subsequently try to uh, retrospectively uh, uh, recapitulate all the targeted systems uh, by existing covalent inhibitors. And we are focusing on kinases because uh, there have been already a lot of uh, uh, targeted covalent inhibitors uh, engaging the systems in, in kinases. All right, so now I want to talk about something that uh, perhaps is related also to Miguel's work. Um, yesterday we heard about uh, those uh, amino groups, charged amino groups, right? So um, early on, actually, the first uh, inhibitor afatinib was in fact targeting EGFR on kinase. EGFR kinase has a cysteine in the front pocket, conveniently located, ready to be inhibited or engaged. And now this cysteine has a very interesting property, namely it's at the N uh, terminal end of a helix. This we call the N cap cysteine. This has been discussed in the literature in, in uh, even by Sir Alan Firsch, I think in the late eighties about in the, in the context of folding. So why, there are cysteines occurring at the end, uh, terminal end of a helix. And it turns out this is the most popular site of all kinases that have ever been targeted. And in fact, we studied all the kinases that possess this NCAP cysteine and also the NCAP minus two cysteines shown uh, below the line. And we asked question, are these cysteines actually reactive? It turns out they are, except for, except for a few of them, which I will show you um, on this plot. So there are only four of them out of these. This is actually not complete. There are four more uh, uh, kinases. The only four of them that have this NCAP systems as unreactive based on our uh, constant pH simulations. And three of them are linked to EGFR. These are the analogs of EGFR. One of them is BLK is from a, a different family from a SARC family. The other ones are from EGFR family. And it turns out all these cysteines have a neighbor aspartic acid 800, what I call the NCAP plus three position. So this is interesting. They're not actually within hydrogen bond distance, but close 3.5-ish. And first I thought, okay, maybe they can form hydrogen bond and we are doing classical MD, right? We're not moving proton. Maybe proton can be shifted to the aspartic side. But upon simulation, we realized they actually cannot form hydrogen bond in the presence of ligand. And then we read lots of li literature paper and talked to you know, pharmaceutical people. And we realized that a lot of these inhibitors actually have a um, beta tetra uh, tetramethyl amino group, what we call TMAM group. Beta means it's at the C beta position installed. And this group, if you read literature, this is before the afadenib was discovered, actually was used to not to solubilize as one reason. B is actually to activate inhibitor. It turns out if you do not have this group, these inhibitor, I see 50 values are very high, so they're not um, active. So um, the original uh, uh, developers of this, uh, uh, the AGFR inhibitors actually studied um, these various inhibitors in solution, what I'm showing you here. So as you can see here, the 16A is what we are interested in. It should be a positively charged tetraamino group. And if you compare to the compound B, the question is which one is more reactive, right? They did experiment. I'm not copying the entire table with this is a competitive assay. So two compounds, one is the reference, our um, inhibitor of interest, the other ones are uh, competitive um, compounds and ask question, which one of them can convert glutathione? So can form, the hydro can form a covalent bond with glutathione. And it turns out only A can do that. The A is the 16A, this reference compound. So 23%, B is 2%, 0%, 0%, 0%. So it proves that adding this T-MEM group increases the reactivity of the warhead. And we actually have a, um, 
uh, quantum study where we showed uh, in various ways that indeed you can uh, prove that the reaction barrier using this TMAM group is substantially lower than the other group. Okay, so, so far about uh, reactive systems. So reactive systems are good, but importantly, they need to be near a targetable pocket, right? So that brings us to the question uh, of whether these systems are actually lignable. Lignable means a ligand can bind to. So we studied ERK pathway kinases, a dozen of them. And we found out that there are actually many reactive systems that are not targetable because they're on the awkward locations that you cannot form a, uh, you cannot use the inhibitor to, to bind to the site. And conversely, there are actually um, systems such as the DFG minus one that's non-reactive, but nonetheless, it has been targeted uh, in pharmaceutical industry uh, using uh, the technique that I showed you with TMAM or other um, base catalysts installed on the warhead. So with that, we decided to do uh, analysis based on not just constant pH simulations, but also pocket analysis, analysis to understand what systems are uh, lignable and reactive. And that's very tedious. Yeah. And currently we only have a couple of hundred uh, pro human proteins that have been drugged. However, we have at least 10,000 proteins in our body with post-translational modifications and, and, and other phosphorylation, we have more than 100,000 proteins that we want to drug. So wouldn't it be nice if we can drug all of them or find some kind of match inhibitors that we can modulate their function of? So that really inspired us to conduct a machine learning study. So in a group, we have now used variety of machine learning techniques to, to uh, help a variety of studies. Now in this study, we ask question whether we can predict lignable systems in any protein based on the structural knowledge. So how do we begin? Naturally, we looked at our PDB database and I must confirm what someone was saying, I think maybe Anna, data cleaning is the most important part. We spent many, many months writing scripts to clean up the data and pull out the wrong information. So in this data set, we have, uh, Actually, I, somehow I don't, the numbers are not showing. So about seven, yeah, okay, 780 unique proteins and uh, just over a thousand unique systems. And now uh, this include two separate databases already published and our own. This is all we can find in the P data bank. And also after cleaning up uh, some covalent modifications that are not, uh, not right uh, in our definition. So then what we did, uh, now here's to what uh, Marilyn was saying. We cannot say the PDB structures are not, not right because we don't like them because they don't give us the good PK value. We need to use them. We use that to augment the data set. This is a very typical machine learning technique, data augmentation. So you, doing that, we now augment it to um, over 10K structures for the positive cases. But for each positive system, we have six negative systems. So if we augment all of them, we would have you no know, unbalanced, unbalanced data set, too, too many negative uh, structural representations. So in machine learning technique, it's called undersampling. So we undersample those negative cases. Now we have about uh, 10,000 uh, structures for each positive negative cases. And positive, we mean it has been covalent modified based on the crystal structure information. And negative means they have not been completely modified. It doesn't necessarily mean they cannot, right? So that's the part is a major caveat of our uh, study is if they had not been modified, it doesn't mean they cannot be. All right, so um, on the right, you can see this, the KRAS protein with the C, uh, C12, C, cysteine 12, this is our test set. And actually it was predicted as positive. Now in this data set, um, it's very good. We have monomers and dimers and multimers, right? So the monomers is, is just over 50%, the rest of them are multimers. And this is very important because we wanna engage the PPIs, protein-protein interface. That's the uh, no, hot topic in, in everyone's mind in, in uh, drug discovery industry. 
So we show here that you know we have a lot of uh, PPI representations. So um, the other uh, intriguing fact is that we thought in the PDB uh, the ligand bound structures are overly represented because when medicinal chemistry study these, they typically have some ligand to probe the function of right. So typically the structures are solved in complex with ligands. And indeed, we have lots of hollow structures. But we also have uh, lots of apo structures. That's actually gratifying for me to see. I, f I first thought we, we can only have hollow structures. So then we use the uh, decision tree methods. This is a simple representation. You know, you ask questions along the way. You, you came up with a classifications uh, answer, right? Accept offer or denied offer. In this case, lignable cysteine or non-lignable cysteine. All right, so this is another picture. How am I doing with time? Three minutes. Oh, wow. Okay, so um, this, no, we, in the decision tree models, we, this is the second most important part is the features. And we like physics. So it's a lot of physics-based features that we uh, devised or borrowed from, uh, from others. Um, this is just a rough list. There's about 60 of them. This is just categories. Um, no, solvent accessibility is very important. Distance to pockets, is, we know they, they, they got to be important. Um, and then, you know, these are the details. How do you actually calculate what actually exactly you are calculating? And then we need to evaluate um, the developed models using uh, uh, different metrics, right? Recall means what is the percentage of true positives you identified, and precision means what is the correct percentage among these posit true positive among the positives and then selectivity is uh, your accuracy for the negative cases and uh, negative predict value is the precision for the negative cases now we can look at our an AUC probably will know one is the best right can never reach that now what's our uh, test performance and these are data that's not seen by the machine learning models so um it's gratifying to see we don't have a significant disadvantage for dimers and multimers. That's all I want to say. And also for PPIs versus non-PPIs. And um, you know, using the tree-based model, to perhaps the, the best, best advantage is to, to look at the feature importance. There are two ways of looking at feature importance. One is to compute the feature importance scores. And of course, the SASA value for the side chain comes out as the most important and followed by the distance to the nearest um, binding pocket. Another way to look at these features is to, to ask what's the sharp sharp value. This means what's the contribution of uh, individual um, features. So um, if you see the sharp value is, is your prediction score, right? So if you see the lots of data point on the right, that means that feature pushes the, uh, your prediction score to the um, positive value. And then you can look at the color based on the feature value. So I think for the sake of time, I'm not gonna say that. Another uh, model type of model we use is a convolution neural net. It's the 3D approach. So this has been used in image recognition uh, field a lot. So we, um, we have a structure. We put this uh, structure in the 20, uh, 20 by 20 to by 20 uh, cube with uh, one angstrom grid, and we center this, uh, this 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 cube around our cysteine residue. Okay, and then we uh, uh, for each grid we have 18 channels uh, encoding different uh, one hot encoding different features, and then we can do the um, convolution layer and pooling and and blah blah, and you they can make a prediction of leakability ability of these cystings. So now we compare the extra tree-based model. This, this is just an example. We have other um, tree-based model. Right? And so the tree-based model with CNA models, so we can see that surprisingly, the tree-based model has actually um, higher accuracy for the test set. So about 94% um, AUC, and recall is 89%, and versus the CNN, uh, AUC is 89%, recall is 86%. So slightly better than the CNN. And now, that's the exciting part for me. We worked very, very hard for months to figure out this. So we want to go towards the proteome. And now I don't know whether you guys know about revolution in um, chemoproteomics. I think the next Nobel Prize may be there. Now they have used cancer lines, cancer cell, cell lines and other cell lines to pull out these uh, lignable systems. 
in many, many proteins, 10,000 proteins more. And then can we back predict, can we predict those numbers, right? So some of them have PDB structures, some of them don't. So for those that don't, we use alpha fold structures. And these are our results. Our recall is 85% for the PDB uh, structures representations. And then the, for the alpha fold, we have 85% uh, recall value. Recall is the accuracy for the positive cases. That's what we care most, right? And now with the CNN, uh, we have um, uh, slightly lower recall, um, but similar um, for alpha fold using alpha fold structures. And the question is why we have a performance drop going toward the proteomic data. So we looked at a couple of things. So for instance, if we look at the solvent accessible surface areas of, of these proteins, we have a, you know, we discovered a different distribution. For those uh, cellular uh, cell line data, those proteins, most of their cysteine, a lot of their cysteines are buried, right? You see the uh, peak towards um, smaller uh, uh, values, and this is actually nanometer. So, uh, so meaning that the cysteines are more buried in, in that data set compared to the, the PDB data set. Um, and, uh, oh no, sorry. I, I, so in our data set, the, uh, right, so the, the SASA distribution is different. In, in the um, um, proteomic data set, the distribution is much wider. And uh, in terms of pocket distance, a lot of them actually very far from the pocket. Uh, and nonetheless, uh, proteomic data label them as yes, ligable. Am I over time? All right, so um, I want to uh, no, thank again uh, Ruben, uh, research associate, and Joe, as the All Rights Fellow, and and um, and Minjie who have uh, helped with this uh, pro uh, machine learning project. And uh, we have actually one PhD student or postdoc opening. So if uh, anyone, especially girls who are interested, please um, email me. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Hello, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering, you mentioned that when you have structural waters, you can exchange them for hydronium instead of the ionizable, um, no, protonable pro, 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 chloride that you were mentioning. How does that work if there are no structural waters? Is that like a random water in the, in the solvent that is exchanged for hydronium? Yeah, right now we have uh, uh, those titrated water randomly distributed in, in the bulk in solution. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that is no criteria for proximity to the system? No, no. no right now they, we put them quite far away in randomly distributed in solution. We, we have a Monte Carlo script that randomly oh, pick okay. a residue and place, yeah, okay. convert, Thank yeah. Thank you. Jenna, right yes. here. Um, I was curious about your comment about looking for cysteines to drug protein protein interactions because that would imply it's near the surface, and surface cysteines are almost always involved in disulfides. No, they're so, um, PPIs. The, they're yeah, they're protein, protein, protein interactions. Yeah, so right. that's yeah. what's creating that interaction. And yeah, you can right. reduce it, but the the um, crystal structure that you're working with was done under reducing conditions. And so you're working with something that's not actually biologically active. So that's a very good question. We have a, a plot to show oxidized versus uh, reduced. Yeah, but the, we were careful in, in picking out those. We make sure those are not uh, disulfide, uh, cyst disulfide bondable or whatever you call that, uh, cystines. We pull those out actually and treat them separately. Yeah, there's, uh, I think this is just the beginning of our work because we, we know now um, there's oxidized reduced form. And also when cell undergo certain uh, conditions, the proteins actually adopt different conformations. Yeah, the um, Benjamin Krabbe group showed that uh, using the proteomic data. We are starting to work with them and that requires constant pH simulations. Yes. Yeah, no, uh, just on the very, very nice talk, the 
cysteines in the kinases that you considered are those um, ones that are known to actually be inhibitory. So if you go in with your molecule that right. binds, it will inhibit. And how does the inhib inhibition work? Oh, those are the covalent uh, drugs, right? Right. Yeah, how does... uh, they're located in such a way that they inhibit the, the PPI interaction? Uh, no, no, so far not. The PPI is the, the, the dream, the, the, the heart. The, no, so far these uh, cystings have been near the pockets. So the front pocket cysting that I mentioned is the most popular site. All the kinases that have this front pocket cysting have been already drugged. So we looked at all of them, asked question whether they are reactive and turned out they are except for five. And we found a reason why, because they have aspartic acid nearby. Thanks. On the, on the training of the reactive uh, cysteines, so the PDB is, has a lot of uh, structures that are very similar in sequence space. So whenever creating, uh, you know, when doing the data split, we should be very, very worried about that and, and because no. if we don't do anything and just random split, there's a very high chance of overfitting. And that, that's a, that's yeah, so you, you trust me, we, we are very, we, we did very thorough work. All the splitting, non-redundancy and needs to know. Yes, we know this business, okay? So we know how to do this. Otherwise we cannot compare with the, I mean, these are, no, we need to go big, right? Proteomic scale and compare with the proteomic data. No, no. We, we cannot play those games that, yeah. yeah. Um, could I ask you, like bring you back a little bit to the <clears throat> discussion of the techniques of the simulations it, uh, itself, themselves. The, um, in general field where people are trying to do drug design by multiple calculations, free energies and the fi fixed force fields, no pH variations. The charged ligands are considered to be a danger and most drug design kind of computational drug design uh, companies will stay a away from any kind of charges on the ligands because they're problematic in simulations. Uh, in part, probably what Tom yesterday showed up small boxes, problematic long range electrostatics and things like that. In your case, would that be also a concern or are you dealing with that in some way? Okay, so yeah, so Miguel and I have agreement on this magic nitrogen. You gotta have nitrogen that have pK values just about 7.5. That gives you solubility, titratability. They can cross the membrane of potentially by changing the titratable, uh, the protonation state. And about your comment that you cannot have charge, that's, that's not true. So no, we work that. Yeah. You cannot, but it, it, it's known problem in the simulation. So would that create an extra Oh, no problem in the simulation? Well, basically treating a charge in the middle of the protein, it's from what I know, the liga, basically prediction of the bound ligand, if it's charged. Oh, yes, yes. You need uh, to have a finite size. Standard yeah. force field is much more problematic than if to predict a neutral ligand. No, you don't. Uh, so the force field is fine, but you need to have a finite size correction. I think Tom also mentioned that it's, it's about one kcal. Uh, that was my question. Because yeah, so yeah, so in, yeah. in constant pH, we're more tricky because it's not just one site, right? Minus one or plus one, you have multiple sites. Yeah, so that's, no, we can talk about this uh, later. And then also uh, what the field has not realized is that um, the ligand can protonate and deprotonate upon binding. Yes, exactly. So we have a paper that more than one paper we, 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 we got in a 2007. That's realize that it's yeah. just a difficult problem to solve. So you have one solution. The question is when you have a charge system and you're simulating, are you doing all those corrections or you, how are you dealing with the charges? So you just throw them in and hope that simulation will work, out, work it out. Well, ideally I mean, you want to use constant pH, right? Let the... <laughs> That changes That's, charge in your simulation, right? Constant pH changes right. charges. Yes. What do you do to simulate those charges? That's my question. What do you do? You should have multiple sets of parameters, right? One for, for each charge state. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Sorry, we've I'm not, not completely addressed, just in your... Yes, yeah, no. yeah. yeah. So, Yesterday, you alluded to the fact that, okay, these inhibitors, they have this Lewis base, which might be a problem. 
but the Lewis base is essential for activation of cysteines. But you do realize that, for instance, the, the, the inhibitors that I was telling you about were TKIs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and only a very small percentage of those are actually uh, covalent inhibitors. So they are just mimicking the binding pocket of ADP. So they just bind there. The, the positive charge is there, and it's in reasons for most of these compounds, because uh, yeah. they, they, they are good drugs because they are very soluble, but the positive charge is a problem. The yes. fact that there are some uh, compounds that need this positive charge to be active, that's, I would say that it's a problem of their design. Let me tell you this way. So it's the only compounds that I know of that have negative charge is base one inhibitors because um, yeah, people love nitrogens. And for your case, right? So the ATP, you also have an electrostatic encounter issue, right? When you, kinetics, K on, if you have a positive charge engaging the ATP side, maybe that's, that's good. The K on would, would accelerate K on. But my question to you is, why aren't there more negative drugs, negative, negatively charged drugs? There's a clear imbalance. I think it's a flaw right from the beginning. The, the guys in the 50s and 60s that were uh, uh, the, the masterminds behind drugs, they, they decided to use Lewis Bayes' chemistry is very easy to uh, do. My guess is um, with the amino group, right? The PK values are really very close to 7.5. So the, right, titrating is you, easier, whereas the aspartic acid. Yeah, you need, minus, you need uh, carboxylic acid bio is also. Yeah, carboxylic acid, the PK value is too far from from seven points. Agreed. Uh, great talk. Uh, so two small questions. Uh, so uh, can you comment on the resistance from mutations that happens in uh, covalent versus non-covalent bound drugs? Is there an inherent yes. advantage of covalent bound drugs? Yes, that's good. Uh, yes, in fact, um, the first, right, the first EGFR inhibitors after a while uh, the system got mutated. Yep. Yes. Because last week, uh, Dorothy Kern's com yeah. company came up with a, the Relay Therapeutics came up with a drug that was also uh, covalently bound. So I was just thinking that might be uh, to have. Uh, the other question that I have is, uh, uh, might we have solved another problem, but I ask, want to ask if you have thought about it. So cross-correlation mass spec has sites where these cysteines can actually be bound and then you find sites where, you know, that can be subsequently used for doing mass spec. Can some of this inform, like might be, uh, have, you, have you thought about it? Like uh, uh, something that is druggable using a covalent system in principle is also bindable with linkers for, uh, uh, for doing mass spec and seeing if, if things complex together or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, this has been done. The, okay, I see. Uh, it's a guy from Stanford, yeah. So you, you ha they, they have a tag that uh, fluorescent Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And like, can these predictions that, that you showed us today, can that be extended? Or like that, even that's done at the level of predictions of predicting this. Uh, you mean compare with them? I mean, even like, yeah, like to, to either compare or like, even like create a prediction for oh, not okay. just druggable, like yeah, the, the, yeah. So, the CNN that you showed. So, yeah. So we are uh, starting to work with um, Kravit, he's kind of the leader of the field. So he said that they have actually lots of data that they didn't publish because they are not sure which site. They know which protein, but the site is very difficult to identify. So these are the cases that we can you know, try to make uh, predictions for. The, the CNN that you showed, yeah. uh, the, the, the prediction layer that was uh, druggable yeah. uh, or ligandable, as you Ragnable, mentioned, yeah. that could also be cross-linkable. And, yes, yes. and, and that opens a new area, essentially. Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that will... Yeah. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, um, trying to understand what's the difference between you know, the proteomic data and the PDB data in a you know, cell environment versus the crystal environment, maybe it's different. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make a comment on the difference between, I'm over here, yeah, between um, binding anions and cations. And, uh, it, it, a long time ago, I wrote a paper, which I don't think many people have seen, which is on the difference that, that basically 
the backbone dipoles really are ha are, tend to be very positive inside and they like to bind anions. So you can bind anions like phosphate, sulfate, um, all the carboxylic acids that are part of the metabolite to sugars. Um, you can bind those only with backbone because basically the nitrogen, the hydrogens on the backbone are much smaller and, and they can make a much tighter loop. The carbonyls are much bigger and they can't do that. So cations don't, cations need side chains to bind. Anions can be bound, on, a loop can unfold and bind, bind an anion. So that may be one of the reasons maybe the drugs don't like the, the anion binding, maybe they're less specific, but on the other hand, they might be stickier. But, but essentially because of the, the different shape of the oxygen in the, in the backbone and the hydrogen in the backbone, oxygens really can't make a tight loop and just by themselves bind a, a charge. Mm -hmm. So cations, metals are bound always by side chains, but anions often not. 